Today we're diving into another important concept in hemodynamic assessment of the cardiac function, and we'll explain what is afterload. If you remember our discussion on preload, you're already halfway there because these two terms have a lot in common. Let's get started. To understand afterload, let's begin with a pressure volume loop, a fundamental concept in cardiology that helps us visualize the heart's function during a cardiac cycle. Here we have volume on the x-axis and pressure on the y-axis. Let's sketch out the pressure volume loop. We'll start with two important lines, the end diastolic pressure volume relationship, or EDPVR, which shows how pressure and volume relate when the heart is relaxed, and the end systolic pressure volume relationship, or ESPVR, which represents the heart when it is fully contracted. Next, we'll draw the loop itself. During diastole, the heart fills with blood, increasing volume. Then it contracts, increasing pressure during the isovolumic contraction phase before the aortic valve opens and the blood is ejected into the aorta. And finally, the aortic valve closes and the heart relaxes, that causes pressure to decrease, and the heart starts filling again during diastole. This forms our pressure volume loop of the cardiac cycle. Now let's define afterload. Afterload is the left ventricular wall stress, so it is similar to preload, but here it is during ejection phase, the phase when the heart is pumping blood into the aorta. This can be visualized on our pressure volume loop as the segment where ejection occurs between opening and closing of the aortic valve. So this part of the curve is afterload. It is interesting as we had a time point for preload at end of diastole, but in afterload we have indefinite number of points during ejection. Now, since we are defining afterload as the left ventricular wall stress during diastole, and if you remember, wall stress can be calculated using the formula, pressure during ejection multiplied by the radius of the left ventricle during ejection divided by two times the wall thickness during ejection. So based on this formula, if we ignore wall thickness and the radius, you would say afterload can be inferred by the ejection pressure. This ejection pressure is in fact all the pressure points during ejection, including the systolic pressure indicated by the black dotted line and the diastolic pressure indicated by the blue dotted line. Well, you really need to sum all these indefinite pressure points and divide by the number of these points, or to simplify things, you see that the end systolic pressure may estimate the afterload very closely and may be used as an indirect indicator of afterload. Well, we can also use the blood pressure as an indication of afterload, provided that there is no aortic stenosis. You can easily see in the purple example how the end systolic pressure is shifted up on the ESPBR line and how the ejection pressures are elevated compared to the loop in red color indicating increased afterload. So to sum up, afterload is a critical factor in cardiac function, representing the stress on the ventricular wall during ejection. While the detailed calculation involves multiple variables, understanding that it's proportional to pressure during ejection helps simplify this complex concept. Thank you for watching! Provided that there is no aortic stenosis.